Ladies and gentlemen, greetings from India. It is my absolute pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you to the fourth edition and the 11th session of the three-day virtual World University Summit on Universities of the Future, a global partnership for social justice and sustainable development organized by the International Institute for Higher Education Research and Capacity Building, OP Jindal Global University. In the current session, we will delve into the theme of championing change beyond gender stereotypes in academia. I am Nisha Nair, Associate Professor and Associate Dean Jindal Global Law School and Fellow at the International Institute for Higher Education Research and Capacity Building at OP Jindal Global University. And it is my honor to moderate the current session and welcome the panelists. We are delighted to have with us a diverse set of esteemed speakers and thought leaders in academia from different parts of the world, including Greece, Japan, the UK, and India to engage with this important theme. We have with us today, Professor Sona Jharia Mins. Professor Mins is a professor in School of Computer and System Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. In May 2020, she was appointed as Vice Chancellor of Sido Kano Murmu University in Jharkhand, where she instituted Anti-Sexual Harassment Committee as per Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Act 2013, Tribal Women's Study Center in collaboration with Indian Association of Women's Studies, and a master's program on Santal Cultural Studies as a foundational course for research in tribal and indigenous cultures. Being a tribal woman from Jharkhand and a woman, besides her academic research, she engaged in issues of uh, the tribal women and the marginalized. She completed her term as vice chancellor in June 2023 and is presently back at her parent university, Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. Our next panelist is Professor Mara Nikolaidu. Professor Nikolaidu is a professor in the Department of Informatics and Telematics at Harukopia University of Athens since 2007. She currently serves as the rector of the university and is appointed as the representative of Greek universities in the European University Association. Her research focuses on distributed systems and complex system design. Over the last years, she has actively participated in numerous research projects funded by national, European, and international agencies on system engineering, the Internet of Things, cloud and edge computing, cyber physical systems, and smart cities, emphasizing human in the loop and autonomous systems. I welcome Professor Mara to this panel discussion. We also have with us Professor Aya Okada. She is Professor of Political Economy and Dean of the Graduate School of International Development, Nagoya University. Between 2015 and 2019, as Vice Trustee of the University, she led Nagoya University's He for She initiative as one of the 10 university He for She impact champions selected by UN Women. Her research interests include economic and social development, regional planning, education and skills development, and gender and development. Currently, she leads a research project with Japan Society for the Promotion of Science Grant on an international comparison of the promotion of gender equality in STEM fields for higher education. Welcome, and thank you for gracing us with your presence, Professor Okada. Our next illustrious panelist is Professor Margaret Topping. Professor Topping is Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement at Queen's University, Belfast. She's also Professor of French and Intercultural Communication, and her current research centers on debates around travel, migration and mobility, cross-cultural communication and representation, 
and The Public Value of Arts and Humanities. Her recent book, The Humanities Pandemic Towards an Essential Services Approach, argues for the importance of humanities in tackling global challenges such as COVID. Professor Topping is also involved in a range of social innovation initiatives, both within Queen's University and in the wider community, focused on supporting young people to achieve their potential. Welcome to the panel discussion, Professor Topping. The theme for the present panel discussion is championing change beyond gender stereotypes in academia. This concept aims to challenge and overcome deeply ingrained gender stereotypes prevalent in academic institutions, creating an inclusive environment that fosters equality, diversity, and innovation. The summit's primary objective is to initiate a global conversation that urges universities to take proactive measures to question conventional gender norms and biases that impede progress. By promoting change, the summit intends to explore effective strategies for recruiting, retaining, and advancing women in academia, recognizing the significance of diverse perspectives in shaping the future of education and research. By transcending gender stereotypes, academia can symbolize progress, inspiring positive transformation across various fields and societies. On that note, I now invite the panelists to offer their introductory remarks, beginning with Professor Sona Jharia Mintz. I'm very pleased uh, to be part of this illustrious panel at a very important session on, um, uh, uh, on gender stereotyping and beyond, uh, especially as part of this World University Summit, which has been initiated and has been a trend of OP Jindal Global University in India. And the university has been uh, uh, taking uh, landmark measures in certain areas. And I think having an international conversation on an, a topic such as this is, again, a, worth, a noteworthy point. It's it's my honor to be part of this uh, conversation in the next uh, whatever number of minutes we are going to be listening to each other and also uh, speaking to a whole lot uh, of people who are possibly participating online and this mode of participation makes the participation much wider although at, at times there isn't a personal touch but I guess post pandemic we have become so used to this mode also it almost feels like uh, meeting uh, each other in person and especially when we get to see the faces on the screen, at least now I would, to my list, I would add these four colleagues whom I can see and would be interacting in the next few minutes. So I think uh, we'll make our um, specific comments when the questions are posed as a discussion. And I look forward to uh, participating in this conversation, which hopefully will give us an opportunity to learn from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mins, for the introductory remarks. I uh, would now request uh, Professor Mara Nicolaido to uh, please share her thoughts. It's a pleasure to be here with you today and um, talk a little bit about uh, some of the initiatives uh, about uh, gender inclusion and um, policies on how to promote inclusions in the Greek universities. May I just say that although Greece is a small country in size, we have one of the biggest percentage of students per in, in our population regarding um, in comparison with other European countries. And 52 of our students are women. And this goes for bachelor, for masters and um, PhD studies all the same, so the percentage is half men, half women, uh, in, in all the stages uh, in the in the university. Also, almost fifty two percent of the Greek population 
are women. So we believe that um, th there is a barrier that uh, no longer exists here in Greece since uh, um, women have a tendency to obtain um, uh, university degrees in the same percentage and uh, with the same opportunities as men. Though, uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about um, uh, my field, computer science, and uh, this is a field that the percentage of uh, women studying in this area are one of the lowest ones. 25% of uh, our students are women. It is the second lowest one. The first one are computer, are um, architecture and also engineers with a percentage of uh, less than 20%. I believe that um, this is actually um, similar to other European countries. And what we are talking about is a national initiative uh, to challenge uh, students, pupils, girls, to be more involved in STEM and especially in computer science. So this is something that we are trying as a national policy. But what we have also realized is that even though um, 50, almost half of uh, the students in the university are women, in leadership, positions, we have uh, much fewer women. So one of uh, the things that we are wondering is why is that? Is this job not a, an attractive one? Uh, I mean, I serve as a rector for eight years and I believe this is a very fulfilling job. So why not? And we are trying to investigate that. We are working close with uh, the European University Association on the subject, and uh, I may discuss a few of the national policies we are trying uh, to apply in order to increase the percentage of uh, women which are actually involved uh, in um, leadership position in the academia in Greece. But I believe that we can uh, discuss about that in a later stage. So this is uh, from me for, from now, and I'm looking forward hearing your thoughts on the subject as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Mara, for uh, bringing in the angle of uh, gender disparity in terms of disciplinary engagement in higher education, where you know, even though there might be a high number of women who might be pursuing higher education, but there seems to be a, a gap vis-a-vis -vis their uh, enrollment in certain disciplines, say, uh, over others or as compared to others. So that's an important uh, aspect that you have brought into the conversation here. And uh, we would definitely be looking at this uh, drop from the top with respect to why there are so few women in the senior leadership positions. So thank you for your introductory remarks. Uh, I would uh, now request uh, Professor Aya Okada to share her thoughts. Yes, uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Hello, I'm Aya Okada, Dean of the Graduate School of International Development, Nagoya University, Japan. It is my great honor and pleasure to join the World uh, University Summit and in particular this session, uh, despite that it is just after midnight in Japan. Um, as you may know, Japan is lagging much behind other countries in terms of gender equality, as the, two, uh, the, the 2023 uh, Global Gender Gap Report published by the World Economic Forum ranked Japan 125th out of 146 nations. So we are pretty much behind. Uh, however, there has been a growing momentum to improve the situation across Japan, both in the corporate sector and in the academia. And I'm happy to note that my university, Nagoya University, has been recognized as one of the leading universities in Japan in striving to bring about changes. In fact, Nagoya University is one of the first Japanese universities that set up its own on-campus nursery school in 2006, and it is also the first Japanese university to set up its 
own on-campus after-school child care center in 2009. Uh, over the last two decades, Nagoya University has also introduced various measures to improve the, represent, the, the representation of women among the student body, faculty, and in leadership positions. For example, uh, four graduate schools of Nagoya University jointly created a doctor program to train future women leaders, and the university also created a support program for female students in STEM fields. Also, uh, limited women-only PI positions, uh, principal investigator positions, have been created in STEM fields uh, where the underrepresentation of female faculty members is very serious. Based on these experiences of the university, in 2015, when UN Women launched a global movement called He for She to promote gender equality worldwide, Nagoya University was selected as one of the 10 impact champion universities. Uh, this, uh, we were only one of the two universities from Asia. In my capacity as a vice trustee of the university, I was the lead for he for she at Nagoya University. And also I have been involved in various initiatives to promote gender equality at the university and the national level. Uh, joining Hiboshi as an impact champion has helped the university to step up uh, its efforts to improve the representation of women in the faculty as well as in the leadership by raising awareness uh, regarding unconscious bias, particularly among male leaders, by breaking gender stereotypes and by uh, taking institutional approaches uh, such as setting numeric targets. Nonetheless, we still have many challenges and it is still a long way to go before gender equality will be achieved at my university. So only a few minutes, a uh, few months ago, we finally achieved 20% as the female faculty ratio. However, this number is much lower for STEM disciplines, such as science, engineering, and medicine. On a personal note, as Professor Naya uh, introduced, I have been uh, leading a research project with financial support from the JSPS, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science, on an institutional comparative, uh, sorry, international comparative study on, on the, of the promotion of gender equality in STEM fields of higher education. So I'm so interested in the topic uh, of this session, and I would love to learn from other distinguished speakers, and I look forward to the discussion that follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Okada, for sharing some of the uh, concrete measures that Nagoya University has taken to bring in, or rather, uh, increase gender parity in the university. Uh, now, I would request uh, uh, Professor Margaret Topping uh, to share her remarks. Hello, everyone, and many thanks uh, for the invitation to be here. Delighted to be in this session as well. Um, a few opening comments. I guess I start from a position of some optimism, given that more and more women are now leading in universities. We know that Harvard University had its first female president until recently, Professor Drew Gilpin Faust. Um, Oxford also had its first uh, female VC, Professor Louise Richardson. But as Professor Faust said by way of a challenge to an interviewer who described her as the woman president of Harvard, she said, I'm not the woman president of Harvard, I'm the president of, Har of Harvard. So there is still a sense of exceptionality about women being in these roles, and there shouldn't be. Women belong in all places where decisions are being made, and it shouldn't be that women are the exception. And certainly many feminist advocates are, such as Sheryl Sandberg, are looking to the future with some optimism. Um, she talks about how in the future there will be no female leaders, there will just be leaders. 
so in the university context in the UK, the Athena Swan Charter has been a key mechanism uh, for creating the conditions for gender equality and increasing um, uh, increasing female uh, leadership um, in universities. Um, my own university has just been awarded an Athena Swan Gold Award, and it's only the second university in the UK to have achieved that after. So, me just a few words on that for anyone who's not familiar with it. Athena Swan was set up in 2005 as a national charter that was aimed at recognising the advancement of gender equality, particularly in STEM subjects. Um, in 2015, it was expanded to recognise work in arts, humanities and social sciences, uh, business and law, and also to support colleagues in professional and support services. So it looks at a wide range of issues uh, from representation of women at all levels and participation in decision making. It looks at promotion for women, more generally the journey through career milestones. It also looks at how we create an inclusive working environment for all staff. And there have now been um, new uh, equality charters uh, set up in other countries, including, I believe, one in India called Gathi, um, Gender Advancement and Transforming Institutions, which is linked to Athena Swan. But some of the initiatives that my own university have put in place, and we can talk further about those, but it is flexible policies on things like family leave, even recently flexible policies on menopause, uh, fertility treatment leave, um, mentoring programs for academic and professional services staff to support progression, academic progression workshops for women, um, action plans to um, address the gender pay gap in the professoriate, diversity and unconscious bias training, um, reviewing of recruitment materials to make sure we get top female applicants coming forward, ensuring we have gender balance on recruitment panels, um, gender balance on leadership teams, and we have explicit targets for all of those. Also looking at so maybe softer measures, such as how we celebrate and champion women through prestigious public lectures, even through portrait commissions. Five years ago, we had a great hall in the university. The great hall was full of portraits of men. It is now proactively full of more portraits of women who have contributed in leadership. And I think a key part has also been ensuring that there is absolute governance of all of this and that at the highest level of the university, it is being um, supported and driven. So our deputy vice chancellor has equality and diversity inclusion in his or her portfolio. And we have seen significant impacts in terms of representation, a percentage increase in female professors, percentage increase in promotions outcomes for women. We have our first female chancellor, at senior level, we have three male and three female pro-vice chancellors and so on. Um, so, But we're not sitting back and, and becoming complacent. The World Award also includes a very, very robust and, what, and a slightly less optimistic note, I wanted to say that these are very significant quantifiable measures, percentage increases. But I'd also like to say that gender is not a number and targets and percentages increases don't always capture the insidious gender biases that can still persist in our universities. And I think, ironically, for me, those persist precisely those areas where charters like Athena Swan have seen us have most improvements, and that's at senior leadership level. So I think we still do have unconscious biases around women who don't fit with conventional gender stereotypes and expectations, voicing strong opinions can lead to women being cast as aggressive or intimidating. Um, women are also still cast in gender stereotypical roles, having responsibility for well-being, pastoral care. And somewhere in between, we sometimes have a concern for female representation can, that can feel a little bit tokenistic. So we need to have a woman in a photo or a woman attending a dinner. These are unconscious biases. And sometimes they come not just from men, but from women, all of whom would be horrified to believe that they were displaying those biases. But that's what we really need to tackle. And that for me is the really tough work that lies ahead. Um, we have to be conscious, not willing to be vulnerable and to tackle uncomfortable truths about ourselves. And I think for me, this is the next big challenge for us. It's those unconscious biases. I think that's our key focus going forwards, as is the complex nuanced question of intersectionality. So gender interacting with race, sexual orientation, class, other protected characteristics. Um, I'm currently writing a book on awkwardness, 
and I'm particularly focused on women who make people feel awkward because they don't conform to normative conceptions of what women should be and how they should behave. Faced with awkwardness, our reaction is sometimes to, it's either to reject it or to flee from it. I'm arguing that we have to resist those urges to reject or to flee. We have to sit in the awkwardness, not run away from it. Look at ourselves, question why this person is making us feel awkward and what biases on our own parts might be coming into play. Um, that's the challenge for us, I think. It's not one we can tackle easily with a quantifiable target for improvement. But then again, as I said, gender is not a number. Just some initial thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Toppings, for bringing in those interesting ideas, particularly uh, the, the, the idea that women belong at all places. And I think uh, that's uh, that would be a, a shift in, in the thought process which can propel uh, dealing with many of these unco unconscious biases, which uh, Professor Okada also referred to, and then you. And we would, as the conversation today progresses, be more interested in hearing about what the measures that your university has taken to sort of reduce the, the gender pay gap and to have policies in, in, uh, in hiring uh, to the effect that uh, you know, there is a greater gender diversity and parity in uh, hiring and promotion uh, of women in uh, particularly to uh, senior positions. Uh, so with that, uh, I, I think it is time to now uh, proceed to have, uh, 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 have a look at uh, some of the questions that emerges in the context of the current theme. So one of the things that uh, or rather a question that uh, we would like the panel to consider is how in this male dominated field of academia, where women often face challenges when it comes to say gaining visibility and recognition for their contribution, uh, it is crucial to take measure to ensure that women are given the recognition that they deserve while also combating the unconscious bias, the gender stereotypes that limit these opportunities for them. Uh, what steps do you think can be taken to achieve this important goal? Uh, I would request uh, Professor Mintz to perhaps begin this uh, conversation. Um, um, as in the introduction, uh, Professor Nair, you had introduced that for the very short term of three year, a short period of three years term that I was a vice chancellor in, one of the very far flung universities in the hinterland, which is more uh, uh, populated by the indigenous in our country, we call tribal, but indigenous uh, communities. Um, yeah. And it was, it was not, I mean, I don't know whether it was a system or systematic issue that one didn't know. The, the, the previous administrations had never thought of having an anti-sexual harassment committee cell or an infrastructure as integral part of a university, although it's been mandated to have one. And so for me as a vice chancellor to work that through in a, again, needless to say, a male dominated setup was a bit of negotiation to do. And uh, so, I mean, some of these, what I'm trying to uh, uh, state is that although we do from our regular regulatory bodies, such as in India, we have universities grants commission, or you know, even when it it becomes a, almost a law to have safety at um, uh, at workplace through a, a, a law, um, there the these um, instructions and um, the measures are ignored. And so it actually takes women to, uh, and women leaders, unless women leaders take it up, I think it doesn't happen because the bottom up approach, it's so difficult, uh, it's so easy to subside the voices that uh, come from uh, beneath. And so one is to, uh, I think, uh, if the universities are made to answer whether they have XYZ measures because these provisions are not a, a law or rule. 
but they these are to ensure safety and equal towards equality and it all also um, um begins at the entry in higher education and and therefore unless there are more women students in higher education i think um it becomes uh, difficult or it is it becomes easy to shrug these uh, 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 compliances uh, off and even um, as it was being said by uh, uh, professor mara that you know there are certain subject or disciplines where uh, the women are less in number enrolling in higher education now it could also be that there has been this spatial or a geographical marginalization where certain subjects are actually not taught in school and th so there isn't a uniform distribution of all subjects and therefore they do, do not the opportunity to study these subjects at a school level itself is uh, uh, lost and in india being a very complex um, society um to to reach higher education it's required to complete school education and there are a wide uh, number of pockets in a large number of pockets in india where girls students after the age of let's say 12 are they drop out of school just to get engaged in domestic work or i'm sorry to say but this is a reality child marriage marriage before they are they are they can legally be wed married married and so in such a complexity it becomes very very difficult to also um, for that uh, uh, the base to get widened from school and enter the higher education however the university where i i was there was a large number of women students and so it became easy for me to institute some of those measures but i'm very proud to also say i i i am at a university my parent university in new delhi um, jawaharlal nehru university was one of the first in the country to have a committee against sexual harassment and which became a, a model for many universities to have and so um uh, i think but i i want to at this time although i'm i guess i'm overshooting time in july 2023 there was um, um a conclave of women vice chancellors deliberating on how to to promote um to promote women leadership in higher education i am very uh, my term has ended and therefore i didn't get to participate but such deliberations must take place where there are also men around it need not be just women talking about it you see and uh, and so uh, there were 70 uh, the reports say that there were 75 women vice chancellors from the country out of 1500 universities which is a very grim number i was um since in india we've got this complexities of uh, you know marginalized communities and there are scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and we were we we did a head count and we were just eight four coming from the marginalized castes and four coming from the tribes i was the only woman out of this eight out of 1500 universities so it becomes it is a challenge how equality at various segments and various fronts must be brought in equal opportunity must be brought in and thereafter we can take care of other things too i mean because the bottom is it needs to be strong foundation thank you thank you thank you uh, professor mens for Uh, for highlighting the complexities of dealing with this question of gender in the indian context depending upon where you are located in the country and how it could be starkly different in say a region such as jharkhand vis-a-vis -vis, say new delhi uh, 
And and again, I mean, uh, your point on how there is a, a need for men to be equally involved and engaged with these questions. I mean, it also ties up to the uh, he for she uh, initiative that Professor Aya Okada uh, has been a part of. So uh, thank you for uh, bringing those important points to this discussion. Um, uh, with that, I would uh, request uh, uh, Professor Nicolado to uh, share her thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like also to emphasize that uh, uh, this approach, the bottom-up approach is crucial because uh, first of all, you have to actually open the university doors to everybody and you have to provide education for everybody. And this is a basis you can build any other policy because education is not an obligation, it's a right. It's a right for everybody. And the first thing we should advocate for is this. Others will follow. In some countries, things are progressing very quickly. In other ones, slowly. But uh, what we should uh, actually take care of in a global scale is that everyone should see that progress. How we react in the university has to do with how we mature in the society. So even in the universities, we are a reflection of the society or the country we are living in. We have the, the same virtues and we also have uh, the same narrow-minded mindset of the society we live in. Uh, but at um, the same time, we should also act as an example for the society to follow. So it is crucial, first of all, uh, to ensure that uh, um, female students do not drop out and they participate in the same, um, let's say, percentage in all the levels of education, bachelor, master, and PhD degrees. So in some sense, they may face equal opportunities. And the most important thing about that is to empower the individual. And uh, this is an initiative that we have uh, taken in Harkopi University of Athens. And we have promoted it for three years. Now we see this as a national initiative. And this has to do with a series of workshops for students and staff, the same, on empowerment. How to deal with the unconscious bias. How to make people feel stronger to stand against it. Because in many situations, somebody may feel not comfortable enough, but usually they don't say anything about it. They still think about it uh, when they are on their own, they feel upset, but they are not expressing these, uh, let's say, feelings. So for us, it was important to start, um, uh, let's say it, it is a workshop, this runs all over the year in the university, actually to make the feel, make people, make all kinds of people uh, feel comfortable enough to um, actually say to someone, okay, I believe that here in this case, there is a bias from you towards me and I have the right to express my feelings. And maybe it's a small misunderstanding, maybe it is not, but still this is the start to make people realize how we feel for each other. And uh, th this was uh, something that actually worked pretty well in our university. And uh, let me say uh, and something about policies on hiring. We have decided to promote a gender balance um, policy for every call to hire new staff. Because if you talk about STEM in Greece, let's say in this case, only 10% of uh, um, the applicants used to be women. But if we turn things around, uh, you should know that 80% of the law students in Greece are female. And in this case, 
when you start hiring, uh, the situation is, uh, let's say, different. It, it, it is the opposite one. We You have a lot of, uh, um, um, let's say, female applicants and less male applicants. So we started such a policy. And what we realized is that uh, if you have a hiring policy and you say, okay, if you have a call, then you should look for candidates to ensure some gender balance, then uh, what we have realized over the last uh, three years that we have established the policy is that uh, the percentage um, um, of uh, female uh, when hiring STEM or um, the different situation around has been improved. Because if you give people a chance, usually you can find very good candidates. Uh, what we also talk about is uh, uh, ways to promote, um, uh, let's say, a family. I mean, if we have a candidate which is really strong uh, for a university and especially in uh, regional parts of Greece, then we can uh, actually find ways to make easier for the family to come along uh, and uh, ensure jobs in the area. And this was a way to empower, uh, let's say, regional universities in their, their hiring policy, which was equally important. We believe that um, these policies uh, actually may improve uh, the rates in the long time. And at the same time, they don't impose, let's say, differences by themselves because I do not want to be the female rector of Harakopi University. I am the rector of Harakopi University. And I believe this is true for everybody in any position. And I would like to have a, a final remark. We are who we are, we are individuals. And in Greece, we believe uh, that each individual has value. And there is there are a lot of ways to describe an individual. First of all, we have to listen to how the individual describes themselves. And then we have to realize that um, their virtues and their capabilities, in many cases, have nothing to do with the sex or any other way we may discriminate um, themselves. So this is the way to move forward. And we realize that this is difficult but I believe that uh, this is a policy that uh, we should stick to and try the best for a better future, a more sustainable future for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Nicolaido, for highlighting the importance of creating an enabling environment for any effort towards gender, uh, attaining gender parity to be fulfilled, uh, considering, uh, a uh, I mean, for women in particularly, and, you know, when they're looking for education or when they are considering a job, there are other aspects also which intervenes with their ability to either continue the education or even uh, work towards uh, establishing a career for themselves. So uh, thank you for bringing that thought to this discussion. Uh, now I would like to pose a, another question uh, to the panelists. And um, the, uh, the, this is regarding uh, the gender disparity in the area of research funding and say, uh, uh, position uh, uh, or opportunity is in leadership role within academia. Uh, uh, so what are uh, some of the uh, innovative uh, ways or successful strategies that uh, the universities can uh, have implemented or can implement uh, to address and overcome these issues? Uh, I would request uh, Professor Okada to respond. Thank you. Um... In terms of uh, leadership positions, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Professor Topping on the gold medal of uh, Athena Swan. Uh, I have studied a lot about Athena Swan. Um, and uh, uh, actually, I visited some British universities last year. And, and I learned that as Athena Swan was very, very important for making changes. And upon my return, actually, I talked to 
provost of my university that uh, including women in the panel, uh, you know, equality, uh, equity, uh, inclusion, uh, sorry, um, equity, diversity, inclusion officers should be uh, present in the hiring and promotion of uh, promotion panel. And now we are introducing this as a new measure, uh, which is that we have two step uh, hiring panels. Uh, one is uh, at the school level, graduate school level, and the second is uh, institution level at the university level, uh, headed by the provost of the university. So now we are introducing, uh, we are uh, introducing a new rule that um, at the second stage of uh, rec recruitment and also promotion uh, uh, process, uh, women should be present uh, as part of the panels. So that uh, I hope uh, this would be uh, important uh, to uh, promote women in uh, full professor positions and leadership positions. Also in terms of uh, um, the top leadership, we have uh, a rule that 20% uh, of the education and research uh, governing council, which is the apex uh, decision-making body of the university, uh, uh, to have uh, women uh, as 20% uh, should be women uh, in the in the uh, council, so that uh, women should be involved in the uh, top decision making process. Uh, also, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, the hiring, um, uh, in terms of research funds, we have some uh, sub uh, rule uh, at the university that uh, having more women in the uh, higher positions, uh, some incentives would be uh, given to the school as well as the individuals who are hired or promoted. Another uh, major is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have created a female only uh, PI positions, principal investigator positions, which means that in terms of, uh, you know, applying for a research funding, uh, usually women uh, have uh, less visibility, but uh, having, you know, this experience as PI, principal investigators, uh, you know, women can uh, be in a position to lead research projects. So um, also we have, uh, um, uh, in terms of, uh, earlier we discussed the number may not be so important, but, uh, in our case, since we still need uh, need to lead to the threshold, so we have uh, numeric targets in terms of uh, different levels of uh, faculty positions. So um, each school and uh, has uh, uh, each school is required to make annual target, and if you achieve. If your school achieves the targets, you get some kind of financial support from the university. So this incentive scheme uh, seems to be working to motivate male leaders of various graduate schools to hire more women in, in different uh, categories, in different positions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Okada, for sharing uh, such interesting strategies that your institution has adopted, and it seemed to have come to fruition in the context uh, of your work. So uh, I would uh, request Professor Margaret Topping to now please elucidate her thoughts. Hi, yes, thank you. I mean, I, I, I'm very struck by the fact that targets do drive behaviours. And I think that that is, whilst we would hope that the culture, a culture of equality would emerge organically, I, I absolutely agree that the targets do drive the behaviours and that that's what the Athena Swan process in the UK really encourages us to do. I entirely agree with all the colleagues who have talked about that need for the grassroots and the bottom-up approach, but I think it needs to be combined also with, with a top-down approach, and that is about very visible leadership and drive that is ensuring that this is on the agenda. So, for example, we have our Deputy Vice-Chancellor has EDI in his remit. It is clear that he has to deliver on that. But even then, in terms of the grassroots, I think what's so important is to have a very structured and deliberate approach there. So, for instance, what the SWAN um, uh, 
charter encourages us to do is have a, a network of champions in each academic school and interestingly I think someone made the comment about it can't just be women who are doing this a large number of those swan champions are now men uh, and I agree entirely it can't just be women talking about women we're not going to change um, hearts and minds unless we have men involved as well um, but then within that I said until about very deliberate very structured it, we do the same things. It, it's the hard measures around the targets, as well as the softer measures around um, you know, visibility of women. But some of the targets have been, it's been looking at things like um, our recruitment materials. Well, I should say in terms of grassroots and embedding at grassroots, every single policy that is created in the university, whether it's at school level or institutional, has to be a quality screened to ensure that it's not um, uh, unintentionally uh, working against any, any uh, women or indeed any protected group. But in terms of targets, it is things like making sure that our recruitment materials are appropriately attracting um, women. And that's particularly in kind of research and academic posts. And we have a target to try to hit 40% of applicants uh, from applications from women. Um, our recruitment panels themselves uh, are, we are aiming for equal gender balance on the recruitment panels, but certainly at least 33% um, women. Um, in terms of training, again, quality and diversity training, we are aiming for 95% completion. We're aiming for gender balance on our faculty executive boards. We have not hit all of these targets, but I think the targets themselves focus uh, minds on, on the behaviours. And um, I think we have moved to a place where there is an awareness of that. So I'm, I'm very um, much in favour of the sorts of targets that other colleagues have put in place and that we have done in the UK through the Athena Swan. My concern is sometimes that if we always can say, yay, we've done a great job in this target, it takes us away from the rather more kind of insidious unconscious biases issues because we can always say, well, look, we've hit that target. So we have no problem here. Um, so that's it's it's that balancing of the targets driving the behavior, but hopefully subtly changing the culture so that um, those less tangible issues that I highlighted before and that we've all talked about um, also begin to disappear. Um, so yes, I think top down and bottom up, um, structured and deliberate and absolutely targets all the way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Margaret Toppings. Um, uh, in, uh, in fact, I think the panel would agree with you here that the top down and bottoms up approach in this context is crucial. And uh, to uh, have policies uh, and uh, processes in place, which is more gender aware and, and is consciously working towards eliminating bias is definitely the way to go, which would only uh, happen if there is a heightened awareness amongst the uh, in, uh, stakeholders of the university, both at the top and the bottom, about how they need to proceed to fight gender disparity. Um, uh, all right, so at this point, uh, we should uh, consider taking a few questions from the audience. Uh, so one of the questions uh, that we have here, uh, it speaks to the aspect of intersectionality and diversity, uh, uh, two themes which did come up in the course of this conversation. Um, uh, uh, so the question is, uh, intersectionality plays a crucial role in understanding the diverse experience within academia. How can universities effectively incorporate intersectional perspectives into their diversity and inclusion initiatives uh, to address the unique challenges faced by women from marginalized background? Uh, I would uh, request uh, Professor Mintz to uh, share her thoughts. Um. I think this is a very, very important question, and it has been very intelligently uh, drafted. Uh, and and such such deep questions, which have emerged to be at least articulated in times such as ours, has taken a long time. And I think a, a question that has been articulated so deeply cannot be answered. I mean, you know, just in few words, and. I think this leads to um, a, a, a very, very sincere, committed engagement, um, and especially in a country like ours, and even it, it is not going to be dissimilar in other cu uh, cultures, wherever there are these ethnic uh, issues, as well as it's so, uh, you, you know, just talking about gender, 
as uh, I do agree with uh, Professor Topping that it's not about numbers, but there, uh, but setting up targets is as important because otherwise we don't get anywhere. Um, so likewise, the, I mean, you, to, intersectionalities help us uh, see the shades of the problem. But I think from the intersection and the way that, the, the, I, I feel, I mean, I'm a math mathematics student and I'm sure uh, uh, Professor Mara would uh, not disagree with me. The intersection not only has the issues, but could also have those characteristics which can actually be turned into um, the, uh, the strength or even be the core for resistance. Why women or people of various genders have continued to sustain though unjust and un, um, uh, uh, unfair treatment has been meted out to them. And so I think these the topics such as these require a deeper analysis based on very serious research and, see, uh, and also come out with uh, publications such as the book uh, Professor Topping mentioned. And so, so it requires a lot of more sincere, committed, deep engagements to answer this question. Yes, couldn't uh, agree more with you there, Professor Mintz. Uh, Professor uh, Toppings, uh, any thoughts? Uh, Professor, you're on mute. Apologies. Um, I can just give a few insights into the work that we have started on intersectionality. And, and it's it's at an earlier stage, certainly from the pure gender equality work that has been quite well established. Um, but we have now set up a, a race equality charter, um, kind of set of ambitions in, in the university as well, and are uh, taking on similar principles as those that we've used for gender equality. Um, again, we have um, a senior sponsor, a senior academic sponsor, as Hirsch and myself, um, we have champions, race equality champions in every single school. And where we have been at the moment is really to start with assessing, getting the data, because there are myths around um, participation from minority ethnic groups. And we want to understand you know, how many are applying for promotion, how many are successful. And then we're also starting to segment that data in, in terms of gender. So this is, um, as a colleague was saying, this is going to be a, a kind of a very long piece of work, even for us to start to get the data that allows us to understand what are the facts here around participation and, and what are the myths. Um, so that piece of work now is probably only a couple of years um, in, 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 into in progress, but it is already starting to show key areas where um, our, our uh, women from a minority ethnic background more likely to apply for promotion are they more or less likely to succeed and on the back of that for the first time this year we did have we, we've been well established for a number of years in providing um, mentoring support and also academic progression workshops for women academics um, we've now started doing that and we're requested to do that this year from our, our staff from other ethnic minority backgrounds um, again to dispel dispel myths to actually show some of the stats around the likelihood of being promoted and whether there are particular problems there but we have a long way to go. Um, part of our action plan for the Athena Swan Gold Award is to start looking at that intersectionality in a much more focused way. So we've started with race and gender, but I think you know sexual orientation and gender is 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 another key one that we need to look at. Um, so just to reiterate the points that there is a lot of work for us to do and, and no simple answers. And I think that's that is the the key point to make here that we have got to be very very careful about how we handle some of these very complex issues. But what we're doing is starting using the same principles as Athena Swan, and it's been a very good framework, but then starting to begin to see where, where do the intersections happen, but with it being careful not to make kind of casual assumptions around that. So, yes, we need quite some more work on that one. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Toppings, for that response. Uh, quickly, I would request uh, Professor Nicolado to share any closing remarks. Well, on the subject, I believe Margaret said it all. But what I would like to add is that inclusion, um, it's a mindset. It's a way of looking things. So they are, okay, you have promoters and championships, champions, but still, this is something that you have to learn to live with. It's like sustainability. 
It's not something that you do once. It's uh, the way you think about the people around you. It's a way of life. So I believe that uh, this is a constant, uh, constant struggle. So we have to work hard to improve ourselves. This is something that we have learned to do as scientists, as researchers. And this is uh, what uh, we should do for inclusion and environment of all the individuals at any level. And I believe that the universities should be, uh, let's say, the champions, or um, I would say better at uh, the first, the front end of this, the leaders of the society. So we should actually think of that uh, as something that is equally important as our research profile. And I believe uh, that uh, it should be accounted for for all the um, rankings and uh, the ratings uh, the universities are participating in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Nicolado, for uh, bringing in that beautiful thought that inclusion is a mindset. So uh, I think uh, all the panelists here agree that uh, to uh, eradicate uh, this bias, there is a need for all of us to drive our attention towards shaping this mindset that will then come up with ideas and strategies which would lead universities and humanity at large to attain a, a state of, where all genders are equal, equally celebrated with equality and equity in opportunity. Uh, so uh, on that note, I thank all the panelists for this enriching uh, uh, and important discussion, suggesting ideas and strategies that has worked for them, uh, for others to learn from uh, in order to create a more uh, gender inclusive uh, environment and um, adopt an approach to gen attain greater gender parity, a greater uh, gender equality of a more equal world. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting us.